Good morning and we're here today to do a bit of a Q&A about furloughing staff. Um, Harry and I have had quite a few questions over the last couple of days so we thought this was probably a good topic to come and talk about. Yeah and furloughing in itself raises quite a few queries <laughs> so we've We've basically outlined a few of these, a few of the answers. Now, the one thing I will say is before we do start, um, we're just going to outline the eligibility criteria for furloughing. Um, so firstly, the employer must have created and started a POIE scheme on or before the 28th of February. Um, the employer must have a UK bank account and any corresponding staff who are to be put on furloughed must have been on payroll as of the 28th of February. Um, but HMRC doesn't explicitly state whether or not they have to have been paid in this period. So that's something that needs to be investigated in a separate, in a separate area. But they have to have been on payroll. So that's the eligibility criteria. Now we're just going to move on to some of the questions we have encountered. So first question is, can staff work when they are furloughed? And the answer to this is staff can carry out voluntary work. They can carry out training and they can even carry out paid work, but only if the activities do not directly relate to the business in which they've been furloughed, with the exception of training on that one. Um, they cannot generate revenue for or on behalf of the furloughing organisation. Yeah, so just to go into that in a little bit more detail. So what we we've interpreted that legislation as um, an, an employee may have two jobs. So they can be furloughed from one job because that's protecting that particular job, but they can still continue to work in a second job and that one can carry on as normal. They definitely can't do any paid work in the job that they've been furloughed. Now one of the questions we've had quite a lot about, uh, quite a lot of um, in the last couple of weeks is can a furloughed employee go and get another job after they've been furloughed from your job to top up their wage because they're only going to get 80%. And the, the jury's out on that a little bit. There are some people that think, yes, you can, because the point of being furloughed is just to protect the job that you've been um, let go from. Other think, people think you can't. Now, um, in one of the, the there's a, a forum that I'm in where, which is run by a, a lawyer, and her opinion um, is that they probably can, but it should be heavily caveated in the letter that you send to your employee. They need to be aware that they should be available for work. So if, for example, you're furloughing somebody from a nine to five job, then they need to be able to come back to their nine to five job when you, the employer, want them back. Now, if they're not available because they've taken another nine to five job or they've um, you know, used those hours somewhere else, that could put the whole furloughing contract at risk because they haven't really been furloughed. What they've done is gone and got another job. But if, for example, they work nine to five and then they went and got a Saturday job or an evening job, Particularly, we see people wanting to get jobs as key workers, um, working in shops or helping out um, to help people in this time of crisis. So that does appear to be more acceptable. So the, the jury is still out, so as I say, I haven't seen any firm guidance from HMRC that says you can or cannot do it either way. But we think it's quite possible that so long as they don't work during the hours that they would normally work for you, that they could go and get a second job in the evenings or at weekends, the same way they would do if they were working for you to top up their income. So question two is, can staff who are on SSP receive furlough pay? So the answer to that is no. An employee is either off sick or they're on furlough. So if the employee is either um, off sick um, on SSP, after that two weeks worth of SSP, they would want to come back and then they could be furloughed. If the employee is on SSP and has company sick pay, once that two weeks has run out, it's then up to you whether you continue to run company sick pay at 100% of wages or whether you furlough them to protect their job as part of the furlough scheme. Um, it all depends really on what the reason is. If they're coming back to work, then you just bring them back to work on their full pay and they carry on doing what they would normally do. Um, if they are on SSP, then um, the employee would want to come back as soon as possible because the £94.25 is not an awful lot to live on, but you could furlough them afterwards and take them on to that 80%. Yeah. So question number three is, can zero hours or variable hours staff be furloughed? Now, yes, 
from what we can see. Um, but this is still an area that requires some investigation. I'll go into that a little bit as to why. Um, but essentially, um, if you have staff who are on variable hours, if they have been employed or contracted in a form of employment for 12 months prior to the 28th of February, then furloughing would be based upon the higher of these two scenarios. So it would be based on the employee's equivalent earnings at the same time in the previous tax year, or the employee's average earnings for the most recent tax year. So I, oddly, it's based on the higher, when normally HMRC based on the lower. But in this instance, it's on the higher. So this connects in with one of the queries I have later. Um, however, if they have been employed or contracted for less than 12 months prior to the 28th of February, um, then their current year earnings would instead need to be prorated. Um, so kind of makes sense. If they've only worked for you for three months, we just prorated their earnings down and base it on that average. So that part makes sense. Now, here is why it's a little bit of a grey area, which needs a little bit of investigating and a little bit more clarity from HMRC's perspective, in my personal opinion, because the question I would ask is, um, say you have a staff who has variable hours, what if they wouldn't have normally been paid at this time? Um, what if actually they haven't been paid for several weeks or several months, but they're still live on payroll? Because um, the question there is, if you're basing it, and they say they've been employed for 12 months, and you're basing it on the higher of their earnings, what they're saying is you don't base it on this period where they've earned zero, you base it on previous tax year where they've earned money. So I think that's a little bit of a grey area, and I think that one it's going to require a little bit more clarification because that to me just seems a little bit unusual. And you do find in some temp agencies um, that they pop on and pop off, don't they, throughout the tax year as they sort of circulate amongst various uh, employment agencies to, to get work. So they might be on your payroll for four months, off for three months, on somebody else's, back for two months, off for a month, back for three months. So um, we need to look into that a little bit further to work out what is the fairest and most reasonable way to calculate their average pay based on the legislation. Yeah. So question number four is can staff on SMP, on maternity, be furloughed? So yes, under HMRC's guidelines they can be, as an employee can terminate SMP and work, return to work early, which might give them more money. However, that would sacrifice any remaining SMP weeks that were yet to be paid. So if that is... Um, a, an instance that might happen in your business let us know and um, we'll look at that on an individual basis yeah and one thing to say with that is if they are on SMP and they've um, basically recently had the baby they have to have waited at least two weeks um, as per government law or four weeks if they're working in like a factory environment before they could essentially return to work so that part is important. Although most people in this situation probably won't be in that period because that's a very short window. Um, but yes, essentially they could return to work and sacrifice any. But then after furlough, they'd have to, of course, decide whether they're coming back to work or whether or not they aren't. So it's one of those things you've got to sort of weigh up the pros and cons. Yeah, yeah. you might end up with a short term gain for a long term sacrifice, might you? Yeah, I'd say the people who benefit most from that are the people who are in, like, say, like the last 12 weeks of, SS, of SMP. They're the ones who probably get the most benefit from that because it's going to expire anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. So, question number, is this question number five? Oh, I lost count already. I should have numbered these. Uh, <laughs> question number five um, Can I be furloughed across more than one job? So, the answer to this is yes. Um, just so long as you are actually eligible, you meet the eligibility criteria in the corresponding employments in place. Um, now, the interesting part about this one is if you do have more than one job, um, the £2,500 earning cap limit is not relevant per employee, it's relevant per employer. So in theory, if you have one job where you are entitled to £1,300 and another job where you're entitled to £1,300, you can be furloughed for the full 2600 because it's based on each employer, not each employee. So that's a little bit of an interesting one. Although I would have thought with people with two jobs, that's probably not that likely, but it is an interesting area. Okay, so question number six is, which wages are included when calculating furlough entitlement? So this is based on gross wages, so your normal gross wage, excluding any fees, commissions, and bonuses. So that has to be made up by the employer. Yeah, and HMRC have made that really clear, yeah. explicit. 
excludes fees, excludes commissions, excludes bonuses. Yeah, so when we've been furloughing staff, we've been doing it on 80% of their normal gross wage. And then the ERS cost, so the ERS NI and the ERS pension, would typically be, it would be the proportionate 80%, but this payroll system works that out for you anyway. So then we expect when the um, system comes into place, the portal, that we can upload those. I think it'd be quite clear and it'll probably ask what their gross wage is, what their 80% is, and therefore um, what the on costs are that you've calculated. Yeah. Now, question number seven. Um, this is a question of who receives the funds for the furloughed staff? Um, does it get paid to the employer or does it get paid to the dire directly to the employee? Now, with this one, the employer receives the funds directly from HMRC and they essentially process payroll in the usual way and then pay staff in the usual way they would do. So that's how that side works. The employer receives the funds, not the employee directly. OK, and question number eight is if funds can't be claimed, who has to fund the furloughed staff so far? And in short, that is the employer. So it's our responsibility as employers to fund staff before they're furloughed and while they're furloughed and in the interim period until the furlough funds come in. Now you can make a retrospective claim for any March payroll staff that have been furloughed but you can't make it until the end of April. Now we are not sure yet whether the new system, the portal and the refund process is going to be available before you pay April payroll or after you might pay April payroll. So it's a kind of a watch this space situation but you need to try and make sure that you can fund both the March payroll and the April payroll. So March obviously already gone, you'd be paying that with your debtors, with your normal income, with the cash that's in your business, perhaps an overdraft, um, maybe even a, a bank loan if necessary. Um, but you're expected to fund your employees' wages before you are um, compensated by the government. Yeah, and I would prepare to be, I'd basically prepare to fund that. Yeah. So um, I wouldn't count on the government getting the refund to you before you need to pay these necessarily. If no. you can take proactive now, now is definitely the time. Because we've still got time. we're working on with um, some of our clients, isn't it? So there are funding facilities such as IWACA, um, which work on very short-term funding facilities. So it might be that, um, you know, that's an option for you. So speak to your bank if you think you're going to run out of cash and see what they might have. It might be a C-bills loan that you can apply for um, between now and the end of April just to cover your um, payroll costs. But think about it now. You might even be able to cover it from your debtors if you can collect enough cash from people who already owe you money. So look at your accounts, talk to your accountant, try and plan now to make sure you can fund payroll at the end of April um, and then be ready for that cash outflow. But you will get it back, so it's a short-term time difference. Yep. Uh, so question number nine, um, do I have to top up a staff's pay to the full 100 percent or can I just pay the 80 percent? Now, this is a question I've heard from the staff and also from the employer. Um, but the employer is only legally obligated to pay the minimum of 80 percent furloughed staff, but they do not need to top up any pay. However, the employer can choose to do so if they do wish, uh, if they do wish. But of course, they will have to fund the difference. They will have to pay the additional net pay, the additional tax, employers, national insurance, employers, pension. So they will essentially be incurring that cost of topping them up by the additional 20%. But as mentioned, it's entirely optional. The next question is, does the company still need to fund tax and national insurance deductions? So technically, no. If you're paying 80%, we're expecting um, the government to fund that based on the 80% of gross, which should then cover the 80% of tax and national insurance and employee deductions anyway. Um, so we think that that will automatically be funded and it should be part of the portal upload. Yeah, because... What I've had a little read of the legislation, it says that they'll fund 80% of the gross um, up to the cap of 2,500. Well, they'll fund 80% of total cost, haven't they? Total employer, yeah. employee cost. So if you work out your 80% based on the gross, then by default the ERS national insurance and the ERS pension will be the, the equivalent of that 80%. So it won't be quite 80% because, of course, you've got the, the bandings to think about, the you know, the... NI free element and the um, qualifying um, pensions. 
but if you work on 80% of their gross payroll, their normal gross payroll, then that should give you the right figures to complete your claim for furlough staff when the portal's open at the end of April. Yeah, and they'll provide more clarity on that, hopefully. don't know how long the funds are going to take to clear when they have got the system up yeah, and running. Yeah, we don't but... know that. I'm kind of hoping they'll have automated the system, so you put your details in, you put your bank details in, and then it'll be a, a three-day back to process. Uh, I can't imagine yeah. it's going to be any shorter than three days, but three days from a systematic point of view would be, it's optimistic, but you know, it, it's a process. If they can get that process in place so that you go in there, you click the button, and it pays you by backs, then the cash at the, the most optimistic I would have thought would be at least three days after you've yeah. loaded the portal. Now also what we don't know yet is whether you have to pay the funds to your employee and then you have to claim it back, or whether you could say run payroll early and then get the cash in before you have to fund staff. So it's not clear yet which way they're going to allow the portal to be used. I think it's likely going to be the latter. I think if you've got the figures say process on the 25th but you don't pay them until the 30th i think the government's allowing you well this is the impression i get it would make sense wouldn't it will, yeah, yeah. It would make sense. but then uh, the challenge is what happens if april has a slight delay so that's mm -hmm. why we mentioned earlier about having funds available to fund april just in case um so yeah there's a few elements to consider in that one now i think we're on question 11 i keep losing track i should have definitely numbered these, <laughs> numbered these yeah. um so question 11, how long does a staff member need to be furloughed for and when can I as the employer actually claim? So the thing just to make clear here is an employee must be furloughed for at least a three week minimum period. Um, so we can submit a claim every three weeks as a sort of minimum standard. Um, so what it does mean actually, which is quite interesting here, is that you could furlough staff members for say three continuous weeks and then have one week where they're back in the office and then potentially three weeks again. But as long as they're off for at least a three week period, that's the minimum requirement for furloughing. Yeah, now that um, we were asked that particular question by one client who um, is a not for profit. And what they want to do is maintain momentum for um, planning activities through the summer and before they start their programs again in September and not have the whole process sort of keel over and die. So um, I had a look in several forums and again asked the, the lawyer um, who's uh, Suzanne Dibble, if anybody looks, uh, if anybody knows her, really, really lovely lady, um, really knows her stuff. Um, she is suggesting that that's fine and another lady then commented on the same blog post and said actually in a lot of forums that she's in this is being actively encouraged um, by um, the government to try, I haven't seen that anywhere, so I can't prove it, haven't verified it, but it's actively being encouraged, A, because it minimises the claim on the government, and B, it keeps the business going so far as you possibly can. So you could churn staff if you've got different levels of business activity and you need to bring people back and take them off again to meet customer demand. So yes. um, it's a really useful tool to be able to keep the business going but when the staff aren't working and you need those staff costs covered then furlough them for those three week periods um, you know maybe it might be three weeks maybe it might be four five or six definitely no shorter than three but it can be as long as it suits your business to furlough the staff you can then bring them back and I haven't found any minimum requirement for bringing them back so it may be a week or two weeks or three weeks bring them back to do what you need them to do and then you can furlough them again if you need to um, reduce your costs and you don't have the demand in the business. So really, really clever idea um, for creating that work um, workforce that you need to push your business through this crisis. I wouldn't be surprised if the government was trying to incentivise that because three weeks is a little bit unusual. Otherwise, you would have thought it would be, say, four weeks, because yeah, it's just... I, I wonder if it's simply just to try and, you know, minimise that process. I mean, that if, if you furloughed for someone for three weeks out of four, they'd cover 75% of the wages, and then you'd have them back. Um, I don't know. I, I guess it's too complicated if you bring people on and off and on and off. So you've got to have maybe one step change per month, and that three-week period does pretty much cover a uh, one step change per month. So you've got one step change per month and you've got one claim per period, haven't you? 
for yeah. furlough and staff. So you can yeah. only claim for one lot of furloughed wages per employee per period. So, yeah. um, but it does allow you to flex your workforce in accordance with the demand from your customers. So it's another tool that you can use to help push your business through this crisis. Yeah, brilliant little one in the arsenal. Yes, yeah. Uh, so question 12, um, what happens with staff who are on minimum wage? So um, surely if they're getting 80% of their salary when they're already on minimum wage, surely this would drop them below the minimum wage threshold. Now, the answer to this one is yes, because oddly in this instance, um, this is an instance where staff can be paid mi below minimum wage based on that assumption. However, if the staff does carry, if the staff member does carry out additional training, um, then they must be paid at the hourly minimum wage for that element of their time. Um, That's not the that same for people who are not on minimum wage and not then going to be paid below, is it? They can train um, if it's uh, you know useful to their job, but they can't be paid any extra for it. Yes. So it's interesting. Um, it's a very yeah, and our final question, number 13, so um, is do we have to notify employees in writing? Now, some contracts do have the right to furlough staff or lay them off already in them, but we do recommend that you specifically write to them and offer them uh, or advise them that you're intending to furlough their role. We do have a letter template, so um, let us know if you need this. So I would say write to them and specifically confirm in writing what you're going to do, how it's going to work, because this is such a unique circumstance in relation to this pandemic. You would also expect the offer to be formally accepted by the employee. Now, the alternative is to be laid off or be made redundant. And I can't imagine anybody would prefer to take that and have no money um, than be furloughed. And if the business does not recover, then they would be made redundant at the end of this period. But at the moment, to have the staff furloughed and to have the government um, be able to claim on the job retention scheme for the 80% of wages, it's the best solution to keep the employee paid and to keep the payroll going for this three month period. And hopefully the employer will come out of it at the other end. Yeah, and I think this one's really essential for making sure that the employer's covered. So it's not one of these things where we just glaze over it and don't do it. Because even though, very few employees would ever reject the offer in writing. It's essential to have the formal agreement in place. Protect the, protect the company, basically. From a HR perspective as well, um, it stops any disputes because then the staff member knows what's happening. The employer knows what's happening. And then after the period, it could be reviewed. So it's definitely not something to cut the corner of and not do. It is essential. Yeah, and the other thing I would say is if you're going to um, write your letter and there's the risk that they might go and get um, another job somewhere else, you could make it quite clear that you're expecting that employee not to um, search for another job in their normal contracted hours because you don't want anything to threaten the amount that you can claim um, as part of the furloughed wage. So you can yeah. put that into your letter and again the employee accepts it because you do want to make sure if you need to bring them back that they are ready to come back as soon as you need them because those hours that they're contracted to work still are technically yours under that employment contract. Definitely. Otherwise, you just get that whole complication of if they are <laughs> working in the hours they yeah. for you, if they've got to give notice and all of that complicated yeah. stuff. So it, it's still very early days and we haven't really seen you know, the, the outcomes and the consequences of some of these transactions yet, some of these processes. So I would cover yourself um, very, very carefully with the letter that you send to them and make sure it's expected that they are not doing anything else during the time that they're supposed to be working for you. Um, so that's it from us today. Hope that was useful. If you've got any more questions, please pop them in the comments below. Um, if we, as, as we get more updates and as HMRC releases and the government release more information, we'll keep you updated. So bye for now. Bye.